Hello, it is my great honor today to introduce Dr. Matthew M. Hutter, MD, MPH, MBA, FACS, FAS MBS, our 34th president of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery for his presidential address in June, 2021. Dr. Hutter is an extremely accomplished individual. He's a general and GI surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was Harvard educated, went to Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, and then most recently received an MBA degree from MIT. He's a professor of surgery at Harvard. He's director of the MGH Weight Center. He's director of the Codman Center at MGH and he's director of the MGH Surgery Quality Program. My only disclosure as a speaker is that Dr. Hutter, Hutter and I actually come from the same town in Massachusetts, Needham, Mass, seen here in this photo, the town hall of Needham. I didn't know Matt uh, when we were kids and I wasn't really sure why that was. Uh, he had a large family um, and then, um, I realized here's a picture of downtown Needham and, and you can see the train tracks running through the downtown area. And that's what helped me figure out why we hadn't met um, is that uh, there are two sides to the tracks in Needham. And um, when I learned recently when doing this research for Dr. Hutter's presentation that the Hutter family had a pool, I realized that I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks and here's the Hutter family pool, um, where they're filling it here nicely uh, from the hose. And this actually is our president, Matt, along with one of his sisters. And uh, for those of you who don't recognize him, apparently he was a tow-headed blonde boy. So here's Matt as a child in the family pool. Um, here is Matt uh, with his sister, Elizabeth. They were very close growing up. And again, you can see his uh, blonde head of hair uh, in this picture. Now, uh, Matt's parents, uh, Dr. Dolph Hutter and his wife, Sylvia, uh, by all accounts are wonderful people. Um, Dr. Hutter was a cardiologist, uh, recently retired. And here's a picture of them uh, closer to the present time uh, uh, enjoying some uh, family get together. Now here's a picture of Matt Hutter and his four siblings. Um, his oldest sister, uh, Janice Marie, older brother, Joe, uh, sister Elizabeth, and then Johnny, the baby. And the blue arrow here shows you Matt as a child once again. And uh, his lovely wife, Amy, explained to me that he's the one in all the pictures with the bowl cut and the blonde head of hair. So that's, that's Matt. Now this family of five is truly remarkable because here's, here's a picture of them all grown up and uh, they all became doctors in various specialties. Uh, and uh, for those of you who might not recognize Matt uh, because he here used to be blonde and now he's a, he's a brown haired uh, adult male, uh, this blue arrow points out which of the five siblings uh, is Matt Hutter. So here's some pictures from uh, teenage years for Matt. Uh, on the left is his uh, high school picture, a handsome young man now turned brunette. A uh, picture on top with a couple of his uh, siblings and then on the bottom right, you can see him uh, doing one of the things he really enjoyed doing, which was playing lacrosse. Uh, he's quite a good uh, lacrosse player uh, growing up and Matt's very uh, good at sports, enjoyed sports. So here's, here's Matt, uh, he actually played varsity lacrosse for Harvard and I'm told in his junior year, they tied for first in the Ivy League and went to the finals of the NCAA tournament. So quite impressive. This picture is with his dad and his two brothers. Uh, Matt's the one in the lacrosse uniform. Now we turn to his uh, lovely wife, Amy. 
Uh, they met at Harvard as undergrads, and I'm told uh, they both were interested in pursuing economics as a field of study. I, I guess we can uh, figure out how that went for Matt since he's no longer in economics, but uh, uh, maybe with his MBA degree, he's, uh, he's going back to those roots. But here on the left, they are as undergraduates, uh, and then uh, the happy couple to the right here, uh, just recently actually, when their their oldest uh, graduated from high school. So uh, a great couple. Now, Amy, I'm told, um, has uh, some strong interests of her own. She's a great tennis player. She actually spent five years on the tennis tour, pretty impressive, and uh, also uh, now works in finance. So she's stuck with the economic angle. Here's Matt uh, when he went to medical school. And I think this is the day he showed up to his pathology class. And I think everyone in the classroom knew that he was going to be the star pupil because, as you can see, he was wheeling in his own microscope to uh, start the class. And it's a pretty fancy one hooked up to a television with a camera. So that that's definitely Matt to show up uh, with uh, the best abilities in a class. So I, I can see that happening. Here's Matt uh, when he got his MPH degree with his son, Max, uh, enjoying a phone call, celebrating his uh, graduation. And then uh, a great picture, a collage of uh, various trips. Uh, Amy tells me the family enjoys to go on trips. They try to go at least once a year to some uh, great destination as a family. Uh, they have three children, Max, the oldest, Will, the second uh, child, and Anna, the youngest, uh, who just turned 14. And uh, you can see all the various destinations uh, they've been to uh, all over the world and that they really have fun uh, traveling as a family. Um, and of course, the final family member down here at the bottom is Bear, uh, the dog who apparently likes to go out in the kayak. So uh, what a wonderful, wonderful family. So let's turn our attention to Matt as president of the ASMBS. And, and clearly this is a year like no other, uh, tremendous challenges uh, that Matt had to face as our president. Who would have predicted a global pandemic that shut down non-emergent surgery, uh, our inability to hold any in-person meetings and inability to travel anywhere. And Matt actually uh, ended up running a COVID hospital in downtown Boston at the Boston Convention Center for a number of months. Uh, there were numerous conflicts besides these worldwide global conflicts. Uh, one of the major ones is over ASMBS's decision to leave the Obesity Week meeting and uh, conflict with the Obesity Society over that. And uh, that was a very difficult, uh, multiple uh, negotiations, meetings, strategy planning, et cetera, dealing with TOS, trying to work through the conflicts. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is show this picture here of Matt um, and, and the thing that I was impressed with about this picture is you can see here um, evidence between this and the next several pictures of his superhuman human efforts on our behalf this year. I want you to notice this, this large wooden staff that he carried here as he waded into the sea and, um, and it's extraordinary power and I'll, I'll demonstrate that for you uh, now, but this is an example of our leader uh, leading us in his efforts against uh, TOS in the Obesity Week conflict. And uh, here you go. Here's what Matt did for us. He raised his staff and he parted the sea of conflict. And uh, you can see his people, the ASMBS people, uh, can now uh, flee obesity week and return to our to our own meeting, uh, which is what we're at today, the ASMBS annual meeting. So uh, truly, Matt's amazing powers and and pursuit of um, 
of uh, the goals for the organization uh, was incredible. Uh, interestingly, and most importantly, Matt um, didn't forget about uh, the financial aspects. He uh, was able to recover the millions, the several millions of dollars that was withheld from ASMBS. And here he is showing up uh, with the Brinks truck uh, to deposit our uh, long lost funds uh, back in ASMBS coffers. So bravo, bravo to Matt. Um, I would say as, a, as an observer of our president this year that we couldn't have had a better person at the right place and the right time in our organization's history to lead us through some of these challenges. Um, Matt did a phenomenal job. He was dedicated to uh, seeking the best resolution for ASMBS in all the conflicts. He led our organization well. He uh, presented webinars to help people who were in disarray because of the pandemic to uh, help them get back on track with their practices. Really uh, was a phenomenal leader, patient, tolerant, uh, listened to everyone's input, uh, really did a fantastic job leading our organization this year and, and deserves uh, a toast, I think, from all of us for his hard work uh, as he tries to recover in this, uh, in this picture uh, from a hard uh, job well done. So um, now it is my privilege to present to you the 34th president of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, Dr. Matthew M. Hutter. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I guess it is only appropriate that I'm speaking to you via video from behind my desk, as that has been our default mode of communication for over a year now, whether it's been webinars, Zoom meetings, or the top five and the fifth videos. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. The following are my disclosures. None of them present conflicts with my presentation today. The last time we met for the ASMBS annual meeting was during Obesity Week in November 2019 in Las Vegas. Since we had decided to leave Obesity Week and return to a standalone meeting, we had the opportunity to change the timing of the meeting. As we do for all important decisions, we asked you, our members, to vote. This was the second highest vote of all times second only to the vote to continue accreditation. The members spoke loudly and wanted retur to return to a May-June meeting, and therefore, this year's meeting is now in a year and a half since we last met. I am happy to say that we have contracted for all of our future meetings to be held in the spring, and next year will be in Dallas, followed by Las Vegas, then San Diego, Washington, D.C., and then San Antonio in 2026. I would like to start by thanking first and foremost you, our members, for all that you have done this past year and a half. The engine that drives all this work is made up of you, our members, and the 26 committees that have worked diligently since our last annual meeting. The countless hours dedicated to the activities of our society are greatly appreciated, whether it's work on committees, giving talks, webinars, guidelines, and statements. This is a voluntary army that is doing so out of service for the greater good, especially our patients, and your service is greatly appreciated. I especially would like to thank Drs. John, Scott, and Mona Misra for not only putting together this excellent program, but for all the work in the past year and a half, switching from in-person to virtual to hybrid, and now virtual again. I would like to thank the people we work with in our offices, in the clinics, in the operating room, and in the hospital. This is truly a team sport, and all members of the team are critical to provide the optimal care for our patients. I would like to thank the mentors and leaders who have trained and developed us as surgeons. Mine are shown here. And I would like to thank the fellows who have had the privilege to train and from whom I have learned so much. I think we should all thank our families for the sacrifice they have made on behalf of our careers, which involves putting our patients first. I am the fourth out of five children and am blessed to have a very caring and supportive family. Much of this is owed to my mother and father, whose love and passion for work and what they do has made a lasting impression on all the five children. I would like to thank my wife, who 
who I met as a freshman in college, and we've been married for over 22 years. And our children, Max, Will, and Anna, here when they were young, and this is what they look like today at the ages of 18, 16, and 14. I am so proud and lucky to have such thoughtful and caring children. Thank you, Amy, for all you do to make our house a home and our family so loved. I would like to thank the ASMBS staff. I think it is more, more than appropriate that they are shown here in this picture on the Zoom platform, as this has been the reality of this year. And for George Ann Mallory, George Ann, a special thank you for being the heart, mind, and backbone of the organization. You steer the ship through troubled waters, no matter what crew is on board for their fleeting tenure, and always with a smile on, her face, on your face. You are used to guiding sharks, so holding a small, small alligator is nothing for you. My biggest regret from this meeting is that we can't celebrate in person with you, the staff, and our members for all the hard work since the previous meeting, but I look forward to doing so when we can meet in person in the future years. I guess it goes without saying that this past year and a half was more challenging than most due to COVID-19. 15 months ago, COVID-19 came to the USA from China to Italy and through New York and then to Boston where I live. On March 13th, elective surgery was shut down and remained shut down for three months in my state. During this time, the ASMBS kicked into action, producing multiple webinars in order to address the issues and concerns we were facing as COVID swept our nation and life as we knew it shut down. On a Zoom webinar platform, we started the COVID-19 updates on April 14th, 2020. And every other week, we produced a total of six webinars in order to collectively address and understand the challenges as they unfolded. The ASMBS issued a statement about the COVID pandemic, which was published in SWORD, titled Safer Through Surgery. And in that statement from the Executive Council, we stated that metabolic and bariatric surgery should be restarted when it is safe to do so. The ASMBS disagrees with the concept that bariatric surgery should be postponed until the pandemic is over. We went on to say that for those who find elective surgery is not necessary or optional, that the ASMBS asserts that metabolic and bariatric surgery is not elective. It is medically necessary and the best treatment for those with a life-threatening and life-limiting disease of severe obesity. The Independent Community Practice Group created a webinar about surviving the economic impact during COVID. Many hospitals and practices face difficult decisions about staffing and the Paytech Paycheck Protection Program and how best to weather the storm from the economic impact from being shut down. In the webinar about restarting surgery, when and how to do so safely, Cliff Coe from the American College of Surgeons provided us with guidance at the national level, and we also learned from our colleagues in China about their experience with how and when to restart surgery, since when we were shutting down in the U.S., China had already begun opening up. Dr. Charles Zhang from Beijing presented the lessons learned from China. Subsequent webinars addressed ways to prioritize which patients to start with first as we opened up. Dr. Vivek Prashan presented his work on medically necessary time-sensitive surgery in a scoring framework to consider when resuming bariatric surgery. A robust discussion ensued of whether to proceed with lower risk patients first or whether it is actually preferable to proceed with the sicker patients first as they have the most, most to benefit from metabolic and bariatric surgery. As the COVID crisis wore on, it became important to focus not only on the wellness of our patients, but the wellness of ourselves and our staff. This was the focus of another webinar featuring integrated health specialists, as well as communications on the top five and the fifth, highlighting that we as surgeons have been trained to overcome such forces as we make life and death decisions on behalf of our patients. Resiliency is one of our greatest strengths. Now, as our lives and our livelihood are under attack, it is time to use those strengths to heal ourselves. COVID severely impacted the training and education of our fellows. They have a one-year fellowship, which was interrupted for four months. It made it challenging for the trainees to achieve the 50 anastomotic cases required to get a certificate of completion. The Bariatric Surgery Training Committee, led by Matt Martin and Adrian Dan, kicked into action to address these challenges. A new policy was created, which helped to thread the needle between fairness for the fellows, but an insurance for the safety for our patients. 
The Bariatric Surgery Training Committee also developed the Fellow Project. The Fellow Project includes monthly Grand Rounds type webinars, which were developed based upon the ASMBS Fellows curriculum and helped to further ed the education of our fellows during this time when many of the hospitals were focusing on COVID instead of and at the expense of didactics. John F. Kennedy once said, when written in Chinese, the world crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. Although there was certainly danger during the COVID pandemic, there were also multiple opportunities for us and our patients. One of the silver linings of COVID was telehealth. COVID broke down the barriers and allowed the use of telehealth by the development of new platforms, the easement of rules, and the ability to bill for such visits. The ASMBS started a telemedicine task force, which was chaired by Dr. Betsy Dovick and Dr. Rich Peterson. Telehealth is certainly the future for the treatment of obesity, as it decreases barriers to access and facilitates the multidisciplinary long-term care, which is so critical for successful treatment. Virtual care can be instituted on almost all steps of the patient's pathway, excluding, of course, surgery itself. If someone had said that I would operate on a patient who I had never seen or examined before in person, I would have said, no way. However, even now, we are seeing over 95% of our patients virtually. I can virtually go through the consent process with my diagrams and doodles using a tablet and with face-to-face -face virtual platform. We both feel comfortable for them to sign on the X shown here when I meet them for the first time in the induction room. Telehealth is a major benefit to us and our patients, and we need to do everything we, need, we can in order to assure that telehealth remains an option for the care of our patients. Another silver lining of COVID is the realization that obesity is a disease. Although that we have long understood that obesity is a disease, COVID pointed this out to the rest of the world by unfortunately showing that patients with obesity are at high risk for COVID, including increased risk of hospitalization, ICU care, intubation, and mortality. This reality, which was highlighted in the news, in the press, and by the guidelines of the CDC, made it clear to many that obesity is not a lifestyle of choice, but is it not a cosmetic issue. It is actually a disease in an unhealthy state. Another silver lining of COVID was the realization that healthcare is a noble profession and a higher calling. In fact, COVID was a reaffirmation of, what we, of why we all went into healthcare. This is the Boston Convention Center during the ASMBS annual meeting at Obesity Week in 2014. During the COVID crisis, this is what the sign looked like, as it became a field hospital called the Boston Hope Field Hospital. This 1,000 bed field hospital was only for COVID patients, and its goal was to decompress the acute care hospitals in the region. Since our bariatric surgical cases were shut down during COVID, I did not want to sit on the sidelines during health, this healthcare crisis. I was asked to serve as the Chief of Clinical Operations for Boston Hope while the field hospital was standing. I was happy to have had the opportunity to help those in need. That is why we all went into healthcare in the first place. The ASMBS created feature articles called Profiles in Courage and Caring During COVID-19. Here, Dr. Matt Martin and Danielle Friedman are seen working at the Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. This quote from Matt Martin saying, it was the most, it was the worst mass casualty scene I have ever seen, means a lot since he has completed five combat deployments in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Argavon Salas traveled from California to New York and used her vacation time to help out during the critical time. We should all be very proud of so many of our members who stepped up in so many ways during this time of need. After things initially quieted down, a second sur a surge came upon us in December. Here in Boston, we were shut down for over three months again from December through March until a vaccine was accessible to all. We currently are just entering the light at the end of that long tunnel and our masks are off and life as we used to know it seems to be opening up. Another challenge during this time was extrication from Obesity Week. In March of 2019, the ASMBS voted to withdraw from Obesity Week. 
However, after failed attempts with the help of a mediator, legal action ensued for the past 18 months. I am happy to say that as of two weeks ago, we have completed extrication from Obesity Week. The $1.9 million uh, of proceeds from previous meetings has all been received. Meeting contracts that included ASMBS with Obesity Week have been terminated for the next five years, and the ASMBS has secured favorable meeting contracts for these new menus, new venues in the spring through 2026 for our standalone meetings. Though such legal actions are expensive, they were necessary to secure these funds and secure our future. One highlight during this time has been the movement towards creating a board specialty designation. This is termed focus practice designation by the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Medical Specialties. We are the first surgical specialty under the American Board of Surgery to be granted such a designation, which recognizes us as a specialty. It includes a high stakes exam, and we are currently working closely with the American Board of Surgery and have created a board certification committee and a blueprint for the exam has been developed. Item writers have been trained in writing questions. We have an aggressive timeline and hope for surgeons to be able to sit for the exam in spring of 2022. One week before the COVID-19 pandemic swept into the United States, the Executive Council was fortuitous enough to embark on a strategic planning retreat. We wanted to address the big issues facing our patients and our profession in the next five to 10 years. We went through a sticker exercise to identify and then prioritize things impacting our patients, providers, and the ASMBS itself. We were then able to prioritize them with a problem priority matrix based upon effort and impact. You can see here that some of the priorities we identified as a group included weight regain and wellness, addressing stigma and fear, demonstrating and creating value for members, and addressing diversity. These issues became the focus for the projects over the following year and a half at the ASMBS. Shortly thereafter, the brutal killings of George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and countless untold others have triggered widespread outrage. The ASMBS Executive Council, along with the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, released the following statement on racial injustice. In this, we stated that we stand firmly in solidarity with the Black community and pledge to fight against racism, intolerance, violence, and bias by prom promoting and practicing equity, diversity, and inclusion. To be silent is to be part of the problem and not part of the solution, which is unacceptable. The Diversity Inclusion Committee has worked diligently throughout this past year and a half during these most challenging times for our country, through countless initiatives to address diversity and inclusion for our society and our patients. Fair Hussein, the chair, was elected by you, our members, the Executive Council. Congratulations, Dr. Fair Hussein, and a heartfelt thanks to all the members of the committee. One of the major issues we grappled with during our strategic planning is why there are much less than 1% of patients who could have metabolic and bariatric surgery who are actually having surgery each year. In short, why is surgery not mainstream? When you think about it, there are approximately 40 to 50 million people who could have surgery because their BMI is greater than 40 or BMI greater than 35 with weight-related comorbidities or even 30 to 35 with diabetes. However, there are only a quarter million operations performed each year in the United States. Looking at it another way, for every one person who has surgery, there are 160 to 200 people who could benefit from surgery. And of those, only two are referred to or present to a surgeon. My term for this is the funnel. Our goal should be to help move patients through this funnel towards the understanding that surgery is safe and effective and the, treat, the best treatment for severe obesity. This funnel is similar to the classic marketing funnel that is talked about in business schools, which includes awareness, consideration, and conversion. In our setting, people become aware that obesity is a disease. They consider getting treatment and consider their treatment options and present for further discussions for surgical care, at which time they may understand that surgery is the best treatment for them. And conversion is the decision to have surgery.
So why is surgery not mainstream? Well, initially access was the issue, but now insurance coverage is widespread, so we cannot blame that. We have reached out to PCPs and diabetes specialists and cardiologists, transplant specialists and orthopedic surgeons, but this has not been enough. Unfortunately, obesity is considered by many to be a lifestyle choice, a cosmetic issue, and not a disease. We hear things like surgery is cheating or surgery is too extreme, that I do not need surgery, I just need a little help, or that surgery is for the 600 pound patient, that is not me. We hear that surgery is not safe and that everyone gains their weight back. There's a stigma about surgery and recall bias where bad outcomes, even though rare, are remembered more than the frequent good outcomes. So what can we do? The following is a list of six things we can do to help fill this funnel and move patients along the path to the most effective treatment for obesity, surgery. Number one is to raise awareness and educate our patients, including direct-to-consumer education. Number two is to measure and promote quality of life. Live longer, live better. Number three, we need to give our patients a voice and address the stigma. Number four, we need to manage expectations of our, since our patients are or should be our best advocates. Number five, we need to demonstrate and create value for hospitals, hospital systems, and all stakeholders. And number six, we need to embrace obesity medical specialists and multidisciplinary treatments. Let's go over each of these six things. Number one, with regards to raising awareness and educating our patients, the ASMBS has been working towards overhauling the website to be more patient focused. More work needs to be done, but the Public Education Committee and others have been providing excellent content. We have started a campaign called Escape Diabetes. Dr. De Maria spearheaded this initiative, and it hopes to target patients with diabetes who may not understand that metabolic and bariatric surgery is not just weight loss surgery, but the best treatment for, for diabetes. We have started a direct-to-consumer marketing campaign through WebMD. WebMD is the leading health publisher in the United States. We have just completed a six-month campaign in order to guide page, potential patients to the content we have created. The goal of this WebMD campaign is to fill the top of the funnel, which includes awareness and education and engagement. This has been a tremendous success, with over 1 million in-market patients reached, over four minutes on average spent on their native page, which is two times industry standard, and over 12,000 entrances into the provider search tool for the ASMBS. Make sure to update your Find a Provider profile. However, even if you don't, by increasing awareness, education, and engagement, everyone benefits from this. Number two, measuring and promoting quality of life. Live longer, live better. We have the best job in the world. We see our patients not only getting thinner and see their diabetes and other metabolic diseases go in remission, but we get to see this. We get to see the thumbs up. We get to see that they are happy that their quality of life is improved. My favorite part of the job is that one year post-operative visit when we hear our patients state ecstatically how they can play with their kids, how they can go on a plane, how they can shop in stores, and now how they have so much more energy. Through a PCORI funded project, the MBS AQIP has developed a system to capture patient reported outcomes to measure quality of life, including obesity and weight loss quality of life, as well as physical health and obesity related problems. You can see a dramatic increase in their quality of life from preoperative to postoperative relief in both the, the bypass and the sleeve patients. We can see a dramatic decrease in the obesity related problems from preoperatively to postoperatively as well as improvement in the physical health scores. Over 102 centers have opted into the MBSAQIP Patient Reported Outcomes Program, and over 25,000 patients have been enrolled. I am happy to say that metabolic and bariatric surgery is again leading the way as the American College of Surgeons has made national implementation on all the ACS quality programs based upon this MBSAQIP initiative. Starting in August, the patient reported outcomes will be on the IQVIA platform, which will facilitate and streamline the integration with the current MBS AQIP program. Not only does this measure what matters most to our patients, their quality of life, 
but it may also be a better way to capture long-term outcomes and lessen the data collection burden. Number three, giving our patients a voice in fighting the stigma. The Obesity Action Coalition is hard at work, and the ASMBS has played a role in the international movement to fight stigma during World Obesity Day. We need to include patient testimonials and always use patient-first language. No more blame for our patients. When cancer treatment does not work, the oncologist does not blame the patient, they blame the disease. Obesity is a disease, and some people have a more severe form of that disease which requires adjuvant treatments. We should no longer use the word failure. Number four, manage expectations so our patients are our best advocates. The MBSA QIP has created the Risk Benefit Calculator where patients or providers can enter specific information like age, sex, height, weight, and comorbidities, and then receive personalized reports with regard to the risks and benefits to expect following surgery. Not only do they learn about the low complication rates and how they differ between different procedures, but also the expected weight loss for different operations. They also learn what to expect with regards to reduction in comorbidities, depending upon the operation chosen. Through education and patient-specific data, we hope to make sure their expectations are realistic. Implementation and use of the risk-benefit calculator will be the next quality improvement project for the NBSA QIP, so I encourage everyone to get their patients using it today. I would like also to give a shout out to the current MBSA QIP quality improvement project, BSTOP, the Bariatric Surgery Targeting Opioid Prescriptions Project. 310 centers are actively participating in this project, spearheaded by Dr. Tony Petrick. And Dr. Petrick reports excellent interim outcomes to date. Number five, demonstrating value to hospitals, hospital systems, payers and employers. Value is measured by quality over cost, and using the MBS QIP data, we can measure our quality. And currently, the American College of Surgeons is partnering with the Harvard Business School using TDABC, or Time Driven Activity Based Cost Accounting, to measure costs. This was recently developed, and patients, and currently is being piloted at a few centers. It is a very promising project, so we can identify costs to better inform us about our value and ensure that surgical care is adequately reimbursed as this care gets shifted from inpatient to outpatient and also to ambulatory surgical care centers. In the future world of bundled payments and insurance-driven mandates, everyone will certainly need to know their costs and the care of the care provided in order to be economically strong. We also need to create value from our data. And one way to do that would be to leverage our data by working with industry and or the FDA. The goal would be to identify which techniques and technologies are safe and effective so that they can be promoted and improved upon, and which are unsafe or ineffective so that they can, so we can protect our patients. There are multiple different stakeholders, but all would benefit from knowing the quality of a new technique and technology. The Executive Council unanimously, unanimously approved proceeding with this initiative, and the American College of Surgeons Division of Research and Optimal Patient Care Committee has set up a task force to address this as well. And last, and likely most importantly, about what we can do to fill the funnel is embracing obesity medical specialists and multidisciplinary treatment. The obesity treatment pyramid consists of lifestyle modification, intensive medical intervention, pharmacotherapy, bariatric endoscopy, and of course, surgery is the most effective treatment. The greater the intensity of the disease, the greater the treatment that the intensity is warranted. However, jumping up to the top of the pyramid is very difficult for most people with obesity. And that is why for every one person who has surgery, there are almost 200 who not, do, do not make that jump. Embracing obesity medical specialists and multidisciplinary care can allow patients to take one step at a time and climb the obesity treatment pyramid towards surgery through multiple multidisciplinary care, which includes awareness and education about the disease and the treatment options. Currently, obesity medicine is the fastest growing specialty. The American Board of, of Obesity Medicine Diplomats have increased almost tenfold since 2013. Think about heart disease for a moment. 
people do not just go to a cardiac surgeon's office saying they need an operation. They are first evaluated by a cardiologist. And through testing, education, and awareness, eventually surgery may be determined to be the best option. When you look at this graph about obesity treatment outcomes, you can see by far and away that surgery is the most effective treatment for obesity. However, some medications and combinations of medications can help make a difference. Last week, the FDA approved the first new medication for the chronic treatment of obesity since 2014. Semaglutide, 2.4 milligram, is a weekly injection and results are promising. The excitement about new options may increase awareness about obesity and the best treatments for it. What we have at the MGH Weight Center and what I'm proposing for you to consider is having one center, an obesity care home, where multidisciplinary care is provided seamlessly under one roof, a center that includes behavioral programs, medical programs, endoscopic treatments, and surgery. This means one front door with two pathways. Patients can decide if they are ready for the jump to surgery and go directly to surgery if appropriate, or they can choose medical treatment options. Many patients who started with medicine end up with surgery after education and awareness of the safety and effectiveness of surgery. And of course, some of the patients who initially have surgery could benefit from the adjuvant treatments of medications should they need it. Of course, this creates a certain level of complexity as shown here in the process flow map from our center. However, we as a field need to figure out the best pathways in order to provide the best treatments for these patients. At our center, this means embracing obesity medical specialists, and on our team, we have 13 obesity medical specialists providing care for adult and adolescent patients, including an obesity medicine fellow. This means having a bariatric endoscopy team to provide current treatments and explore future treatments for this field. This includes a multidisciplinary team, which includes psychologists specifically trained in the treatment of obesity as well as registered dietitians similarly focused on the obesity treatment options. Together, as a team, we can help the patient climb the pyramid towards the most effective treatment for obesity. First step could include lifestyle modifications, and for others who have already made such changes, pharmacological therapy might be best. During this process, education and awareness helps people understand the safety and effectiveness of surgical care. So, when you think of how best to get patients to treat their obesity, think of the funnel. The top of the funnel is education and awareness with WebMD, search engine marketing, website overhaul, social platforms, and other healthcare providers. Next includes lifestyle modifications with a multidisciplinary team, including dietitians and psychologists. An obesity medical specialist can provide intensive medical interventions as well as anti-obesity medications. Endoscopists and of course surgeons fill out the multidisciplinary team. Without the funnel, only one in about 200 patients who could benefit from surgery actually are having surgery. I'm excited to see how many patients we will be able to treat surgically as we increase education, awareness, and embrace obesity medical specialists. So what can we do or are we doing so that surgery is more mainstream and we can treat more than the less than 1% of the patients who could benefit from surgery? We are raising awareness and educating potential patients with direct-to-consumer education with our WebMD campaign. We are measuring and promoting quality of life, live longer and live better by integrating patient reported outcomes into the MBS AQIP. We're giving our patients a voice in addressing the stigma. We are managing expectations so our patients are our best advocates using such tools as the risk benefit calculator. We are making strides to demonstrate and create value so all stakeholders can understand that tr the true benefit of adequately resourcing surgical programs for obesity. And perhaps most importantly, we need to embrace obesity medical specialists and multidisciplinary team care. COVID-19 has proven that humankind can effectively battle a pandemic when we need to. Obesity is a pandemic whose onset is far more insidious than COVID. And yet the overall total devastation to health and well-being 
measured in quality and quantity of life, is likely more devastating than COVID. This is an amazing time for metabolic and bariatric surgery. We are a mission-driven society, and our mission is to treat the most formidable disease of our time, obesity. We have proven that metabolic and bariatric surgery is remarkably safe. We know from our patients' own mouths that this is the best thing they have ever done to improve their quality of life. We have achieved access to care for most. We are leading the way in accreditation, data collection, continuous quality improvement, fellowship training, and now board specialty designation. And most importantly, we provide the most effective treatment for this disease with our hearts and with our hands. Yet our mission is unmet since we help fewer than 1% of the patients who could benefit from surgery. I hope I have provided you with some ideas and examples of what we are doing or should be doing. Think of the funnel and how we can increase awareness and education by embracing obesity medical specialists and multidisciplinary care. These words, which are emblazoned on the wall in my high school cafeteria, explains much about why I personally do what I do. To whom much is given, much is expected. I personally am blessed to have been given so much. We, as metabolic and bariatric surgeons, have been given so much. And as such, much is expected of us. In the Mason lecture, we heard of three giants, true icons in metabolic and bariatric surgery who passed this year and how much of an impact each one of those individuals made on our field through hard work and perseverance. I would like to ask each and every one of you listening today to think about these icons and then think about what you are going to do to have an impact on our field and our patients. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as your president. So next is my privilege and honor uh, to introduce our next president. Let me again just share my screen as this is again a live presentation. Uh, so our next president, Dr. Shanal Katari. Um, as you know, the ASMBS is one of the only societies where the members actually have a voice in who becomes president. Through our, through our society, other society members uh, rubber stamp a slate for next leaders. With the ASMBS, you have a choice and your vote matters. So please vote when the next, uh, next ballot is out. You chose Dr. Katari two years ago, and after serving on the executive committee of the executive council, the ECEC, as we call it, as secretary treasurer, and then subsequently the president elect, today the gavel will be passed to Shanel as president. I've known Shanel for years and always appreciate his big smile and abilities to make those around him smile. In these past two years and a half, during the weekly ECEC Zoom calls and all that we tackled as a team, I came to appreciate his thoughtful approach, deep insight, and careful consideration of the viewpoints of all stakeholders. The ASMBS is in good hands with your new leader. Dr. Katari attended Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana, and the medical school at the University of Illinois in Peoria. He completed his surgical residency at the Gunderson Clinic in La Crosse, Wisconsin before moving to Richmond, Virginia in the Virginia Commonwealth University Health Center, where he worked with Dr. Harvey Sugarman. Thanks for sharing those stories during the Mason lecture. He then returned to Gunderson in La Crosse, Wisconsin and established a fellowship at this community-based hospital. He has been at Gunderson for most of his key career and moved to Greenville, South Carolina in Prisma Health, where he now serves as the Vice Chair of Medical Staff Affairs and works with John Scott, our program chair. Aside from his patients and his trainees, the rest of Shanel's life is filled with his family and his faith. Shanel married the love of his life, Peg, 22 years ago. Here's a picture from their wedding day. And here he is with Peg and the two children, Brittany and Samantha. Here's another picture of Shanel and his family. And as I said, faith is also important to Shanel. He's been on many missions to Haiti with Mountaintop Ministries and has led weekly Bible study classes at his local church for years. Another thing that is important for Shanel is getting out on his boat. I present to you Dr. Shanel Katari, the next captain of the ship for the ASMBS. I expect smooth sailing for the ASMBS with Shanel at the helm. I hereby pass the presidential gavel to you as the president of the American Society 
for metabolic and bariatric surgery. I think I have to stop sharing my screen for this. Shano, here you go. Thank you for that introduction, Matt. It's really an honor to serve as the president of ASMBS. It's been a privilege to follow in your footsteps. I've learned so much from you over the last few years, and uh, I will continue to seek wise counsel from you as you will continue to be our immediate past president on the executive committee of the executive council. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. And a brief, a brief presentation from Dr. Katari. I want to thank Dr. Hutter for his amazing leadership over the last year and a half during these most challenging times. The impact of COVID-19 combined with the disease of obesity has revealed an added vulnerability of the population that we have dedicated our lives to caring for. Despite the challenges we have faced, we as a society stand committed to improving the care and treatment of people suffering from the disease of obesity, as well as advancing the science and understanding of metabolic and bariatric surgery. Our committees are already hard at work for our membership with a variety of tasks placed before them that will help equip our members and improve the care of our patients. We have seen the value of virtual education, but also the necessity for in-person networking opportunities, and we look forward to in-person meetings in the future. Stay tuned as we are working on our ASMBS Fall Weekend Meeting. We also look forward to seeing you in person at our annual meeting in Dallas, Texas next June, where we will offer state-of-the-art education and training for our membership as we continue our battle to improve access to care for our patients and to overcome discrimination towards the disease of obesity. So I believe we have one more thing to accomplish here, um, which is to present uh, Dr. Hutter with the plaque uh, commemorating his presidential year. So Matt, if I could ask you to, uh, through the magic of technology, produce the plaque. Can you hand it to uh, me? Huh? Can you hand it to me? I I can pretend to. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so let me uh, let me read the inscription on the plaque. It's from the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Be it known, the society hereby recognizes and honors Matthew Hutter, M.D., F.A.S. M.B.S., thirty fourth president. November 6, 2019 to June 11, 2021. And I know I speak for everyone when I say thank you, Matt, for a job well done. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor and I look forward to the rest of the meeting and I can't wait till we can see each other in person. So thank you all. That concludes the session. <laughs>